please give a really warm South by Southwest welcome to Governor Jeb Bush. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, it is a joy to be with you all. Um, the other conference is not as long-standing nor as uh, rich and robust in terms of the folks that come. So I'm glad I got an upgrade to be able to speak at South by Southwest. Um, let me start. Wow, everybody's got a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start by, by trying to change the conversation about edu K-12 education. Um, if you think our schools are great, great. If you don't think they're so hot, that's fine too. I think the one thing in education policy that we should converge on is that our education system has to change because our country's changing. The people, the population of our country is changing dramatically. The world's changing. Innovation is changing us at warp speed, and the systems that we rely on, not just education, but across the board have to change as well. If you start with that premise, then the question, the conversation changes from you're, you know, you're attacking teachers or you're just, you know, you're, you're, you think unions are great or whatever, to something a little more meaningful and powerful, which is how do we assure that every child gains the skills where they can ride the technological wave rather than be drowned by it? Because the simple fact is right now, in a time of abundance, in terms of our economy, there are seven million jobs unfilled. Most of those jobs are unfilled not because people don't want to work, um, but because they don't have the skills to be able to take advantage of those jobs. There are more job openings than there are people looking for work for the first time in recorded history. McKinsey says by 2030, 75 million jobs will either be eliminated or impacted by the convergence of all this technological uh, revolution that's taking place. The convergence, not just of one thing, but a whole series of things, of automation, of uh, artificial intelligence, the ability to mine all the data that we give to big technology companies for them to sell us more stuff. All of that stuff combined, robotics, uh, has created an environment where if you're born poor and you go to a failing school for an extended period of time, 15 years later or 12 years later, um, you're probably not going to ever have a job. That's the world we're moving towards. And so the question is, how do we get to a system where more children are capable of being able to pursue their dreams? I have three suggestions. There's a lot more, and I'm sure in the Q&A section we can talk about that. But the, my three suggestions would be starting first with moving to a mastery-based system of learning where, and this will sound a little radical, where time is the variable and learning's the constant. You can envision, we're so tired to the current paradigms, but envision a system where you master the material, you move on, but if you don't master it, there's remedial help to be able to help you uh, to do it. Sal Khan talks about this in an interesting way, which is if you're in math, if you, you, know, you get an 80, you get a B, or a B minus, which means uh, you get a good grade, but in fact, what that really means is you didn't master 20% of the material. In the next year, when you're trying to learn new math concepts, that 20% could be the difference for you not being able to move forward. And so a mastery-based system, um, which is possible today because of technology, it seems to me, has to be at the core of a 21st century education system. There are examples of this that are quite exciting. There's a, there's a chain of schools, public schools uh, in Sweden. I can't pronounce it in Swedish. It's got like so many consonants and vowels. It goes on forever. But it, we call them knowledge schools, uh, to simplify it, that, that have that model and have been operating it uh, for, for many years. The Summit Schools in California is another very good example of that. There are whole school districts, most of them small, two or three of them, that are doing this uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. Lindsay Unified School District and in uh, Northern California, the Kettle Moraine School District in, in uh, Wisconsin, and a few others. But it's truly on the margins where it, I believe it should be at the core. And the simple reason for this is that this requires changes in policy, which means that you've got to go to the state legislatures, you have to have a governor sign it into law, you have to have the departments of education to create the rules, and the school districts have to embrace this idea. Much of the reforms that seem logical for people um, never happen because that process is really burdensome. It would require funding based on mastery, not on seat time. 180 days, little butts in the seat is the way funding takes place, whether you learn or not. 
it would, uh, it would mean that grading flexibility would have to change because in a mastery-based system, if you make an 80, it might not necessarily be such a, a, a great, you'd have to adjust to the reality of completing the work at a level that, um, that uh, where, where everybody, you know, you have some degree of accountability of where people stand. It would make sure that there's um, higher education um, access for students that are succeeding. The simple fact is, I don't know if you saw the study uh, that came out last week, a quarter of all uh, 11th graders at the end of their year are, are, are capable of taking on college credit. And a small fraction of them actually have a chance to do it because our systems aren't geared to make that happen. The second suggestion I would have is to create career pathways alongside of this. This is a place where um, the intersection of politics and policy actually is a pretty tricycles go through it rather than Mack trucks. There's broad consensus that we have, we have put aside um, technical education or career-oriented uh, education, and there's a growing awareness of its importance going forward. And so imagine a system where nationally recognized certificates where you have mastered a certain skill are embedded in the coursework. In fact, I would argue the aspiration for our country ought to be that every student ought to have the access to, to college education and a nationally recognized certificate along the path of getting a high school degree that means that you actually have graduated from high school not requiring remedial work to redo high school uh, reading and high school math. Sadly, for most public universities, that number is increasing. For four-year universities, the number is approaching 30%. For community college, for entering high school students, that number is over 50%. Who's fooling who? We spend billions of dollars the first time, and we spend billions of dollars the second time. A mastery-based system with a career orientation, I think, uh, should be part of, that, part of that answer. And finally, we ought to tear down the silos between the systems of education. In a child-centered, student-centered system, you would move to a dramatically different place. High school students should not be impeded by accelerating their learning. As I said, a quarter of kids are, are capable of taking um, uh, college-level credits, but they can't because who gets the funding? The arguments, I don't know if you've seen the arguments. I fought those arguments. I've got tire marks on my forehead uh, with this. You can't do it. I mean, how many times do you have to be told you can't do something that is just obvious in terms of its uh, uh, logic? But in fact, there are very few places that have really um, unlocked this great potential. But there's some good examples, again, of how to go about this. There's a, um, there's a, uh, a modern states alliance. A guy named Steve Klinsky has, has decided he was going to create 30 college-level courses for, for high school seniors to be able to take the test, and these are top professors, take the CLEP test to be able to take, basically start uh, college as a sophomore, where your freshman year is for free. That requires policy-wise universities being able to accept all of those credits. Every university ought to accept AP and IB courses as well. If a, if a kid can start college early and they can graduate within four years, we're going to save taxpayers and students billions and billions of dollars. But more importantly, we're going to give these young people the chance to live purposeful lives because they're going to have a customized learning experience that will allow them to ride the technological wave. I wish and I hope that we get beyond the stale political arguments, and I am been a, I, let me, let me just make it clear here. <laughs> I have been in that fight for a long time and envision a different system, a system that would be more student-centered so that we can make sure that this country continues to have the skills to lead the world. Thank you, and be happy to answer any of your questions in the dialogue. Laura? Let's just pick up where you, where you left off, um, talking about a mastery-based system of learning. And I guess the question that first came to my mind was, I could see how that would be you know, very helpful, especially if somebody was advanced and moving along quickly, and that would benefit them. But what would happen to the kids who aren't mastering that material? And then wouldn't a system like that hold the potential that some kids would just be, you know, left in the grades or the lessons um, behind their peers, you know, year after year potentially, and then like sort of- Like they are now. Well, in the sense that I mean, it would maybe the, make the, that stigma, it would make an uh, increased stigma, it would make it even harder for them to move forward yeah. because they would essentially be 
you know, in the equivalent of eighth grade when the kids their age are all in ninth grade, then they're all in 10th grade, and then so, so does someone just lose, lose hope and you know, drop out altogether? Well, that's what they do now. So the system we have today, I think, quietly without a big conversation does just that. You pass kids along worrying about the self-esteem, and that's a legitimate concern of little Johnny, but ultimately if little Johnny can't read, uh, by the time he's in 10th or 11th grade, he's functionally illiterate. His self-esteem problems are going to be far more dramatic and they're lifelong. So intervening early and developing strategies around children that have these gaps is probably the single most powerful reason we should move to a mastery-based system. Liberating the kids that are high achieving is also important. So I don't envision kids being held back every year. So they're a 13-year-old kid in th third grade or something like that. <laughs> I envision a system of learning where chronologically by age they're moving through the learning experience, but because you can customize the learning experience today differently than you could just a decade ago, the kids that could, could, could take on um, more meaningful work or harder work could do that and may actually help the teacher in the classroom develop strategies so that their peers um, that are struggling will be able to learn. There's all sorts of ways to learn. In the knowledge-based uh, schools that I met, I met the guy, uh, the, I went to the school in Stockholm, you have, it's totally chaotic. Basically, the, the students are chaotic in a good sense, by the way. It's chaotic that they are, they are in charge of their learning, and teachers are, are mentoring them, in effect, rather than sitting in front of a classroom teaching the same thing to each one. And they, they learn in groups, they learn in different ways. Each day they start the day kind of to develop a customized strategy for each child. You could see how this would work if we, we have to break the mindset that the system that when, when I went to Grady Elementary in Houston, Texas, 180 years ago it seems like, you know, every kid was more or less the same. And teachers didn't know, that there wasn't any, any access to digital learning of any kind. There weren't any tools in the classroom, and yet we operate in so many ways as though that's the norm, when in fact we have a very diverse population, we have new tools that, that are um, not, not utilized to the maximum, and we can measure all this in a dramatically different way than we once could. And do you think that if somebody needed more than the traditional 12 years of schooling, then would they stay on for longer in order to yeah, get, reach that Yeah, absolutely. Mastery? And so, so what do we do now? We give people, we have an 84% high school graduation rate, and we celebrate it because it's gone up every year for 20 years. That's great. Except a third or even more of those people graduating with a high school diploma can't start college because they have to retake high school reading and high school math. Those are the facts. Remediation rates are through the, through the roof. And they certainly aren't, they're, they're certainly not capable of taking on a job. They're not career ready and they're not college ready. So, so, the, so the argument about worrying about you know, self-esteem again, and if it takes 13 years to go through college, that's a hell of a lot better if you're college ready by the end of 13 than never being college ready and being pushed aside or being told you go to college, but in fact you, have, you can't even start taking college level work then you get frustrated and you drop out. And you probably have student debt along the way just as a little, you know, thank you going away party <laughs> gift. All right, let's move to uh, some other sort of hotbed issues in education, some things that you've been involved in, and then of course we'll come back to the subject as, um, as you all are interested in it. You're putting on your reporter hat now, aren't you? Uh, it's hard for me to take it off. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest, it's just sort of like stuck there. Um, you know, ask my kids, they, they don't always appreciate the reporter hat either. Um, <laughs> The, uh, uh, yeah, I, I can tell you as a reporter, it's no easier to ask your kid what happened in school today that you still get like zero answer. Um, the, um, one of the things that you've been enthusiastic about promoting is online learning. And um, I, that's a, a subject that I think a lot of people are interested in, but it's also a lot of, especially the online charter schools in the K-12 space have not had really great results, and you've also, of course, been very interested in accountability and results. And I'm wondering how you square those two things, and um, we've sure. seen some real problems. Even uh, I'll, I'll give a sort of a, maybe a, a worst case example, but um, the you know, Electronic Classroom of Tomorrow, ECOT in Ohio, which was a, a group that you, um, I believe you spoke at their graduation, you had some support for, um, from Bill Logger who ran it, mm -hmm. that whole thing you know, imploded because it turns out nobody was actually logging on or attending school and they owed millions of dollars to the state at the end. So 
And that's, that's obviously a worst case scenario, I think it's fair to say. But in general, And, and they didn't been, operate in Florida, just for the record. <laughs> no, they did not. It was in okay, Ohio. Just um, so my question would be, just given some of the problems that that has had, and given some of the low um, results that we've seen from um, some of these online charters, you know, what do you see the future of that? And um, do you still think it's a, it's a good part of the solution? I think it's if there's uh, robust accountability around every means of learning that's essential. If state dollars go, taxpayers' dollars go to, go to a, a school, there should be um, not just education or academic accountability, but there ought to be financial accountability as well. A good system should be able to manage that. Uh, Florida's virtual school is the largest of its kind, bigger than the for-profit schools, and, um, and they've had hiccups along the way, but they've also, you know, at their peak, did 500,000 courses in a year. And it gives kids, in, mostly in public schools, the chance to be able to take courses that otherwise they wouldn't be able to access. I don't know how many physics teachers there are in Texas. Uh, my guess is slightly more, but not many more than in Florida, which is slightly close to zero, more cl closer to zero than 1,000. And so if you like physics and you're in a, under, you know, an inner city school or a school in a rural part of Texas or Florida, <laughs> You're not going to be able to take advantage of learning physics. You're not going to be turned on by something that you're passionate about. Florida Virtual School um, allows you to do that. It gives access to AP classes that otherwise people wouldn't be able to see. And so, and they don't get paid unless there is a completion of the course, a really radical idea that I think should spread across the system as well, that you're, you're rewarding performance uh, in, in a job well done. So I think virtual learning inside the classroom and outside the classroom in public uh, charter schools as well as traditional schools is part of the answer. It's not the end all and be all. But I do reject the notion that there's only one way to make sure that uh, students are learning. Because the defenders of the status quo, basically, they're against everything else other than what we do now. And I think what we do now has worked really well for a long period of time, but I, I see, I look over the horizon and I don't see this system being the optimum system to assure that um, the next generation is gonna be successful in life. Well, it's interesting because there was such a focus about accountability. You really pioneered that in Florida. Your brother took it national. And now it feels like there's a real sort of backlash to that. Mm -hmm. We've certainly at the federal level, there's a, a, a way dial back of accountability. ESSA has much fewer, uh, uh, much um, less rigorous requirements on the states than No Child Left Behind had, for, for better or worse. Um, and you certainly see in states um, a variety of ways where they are taking their foot off of that gas pedal yeah. of accountability. And I'm just wondering why you think it there's been such a backlash to it, and you know, how do you move forward without that federal lever in place, and um, assuming you still think that that sort of account accountability results-driven dri approach is a good idea? Well, this will be heretic here in Texas, uh, but I think, um, I think the best, I mean, our accountability system was better than No Child Left Behind. Why it's heretic is my brother was president. You may remember that. Uh, is he here? No, not right oh, okay. here, no. <laughs> Our system, um, you'll find out about it since everybody's got a camera that's more than a camera. Uh, but the, the point being that our system, I think, was the best system. It was state-driven, not federally driven. Now, having said that, there are a whole lot of states that had no accountability until No Child Left Behind. And a whole lot of kids were left behind, particularly low-income kids that were struggling. And that is a fact. And having some degree of oversight over systems to make sure that you can't excuse away why some kids can learn and some kids can't is really important. Um, it's now going to be more state driven in some states, you know, California has got a color code that you couldn't describe. Anybody from California? In the, in the question and answer, you, you describe to me the accountability system of Florida and I, of, of California and I'll, I'll, I'll be grateful because it's quite, um, a parent wouldn't know unless they were really informed. In Florida, it's A, B, C, D, and F. It's pretty simple. And the largest bonus program for teachers in the United States is embedded in our accountability system. It's called the school recognition money. If you show improvement of your grade or your, or your A, you get $100 per student directly to the school, and 90% of that, something like $160 million, goes to teachers in the form of a bonus. So accountability does matter. I think it matters when you create incentives to get more of what you want and disincentives to create less of what you want. 
So in Florida, we, we give bonuses for students that pass AP, IB, uh, gain nationally recognized certificates, um, where, and where the bottom 25% of any school shows improvement. Those are the things that are of great value in our state, and it helps explain why Florida's numbers in terms of the nation's report card have gone up um, from the bottom, literally the bottom. We used to whisper, thank God for, you know, fill in the blank, there was one or two below us, to being um, um, in the, you know, in the hunt, in the top 10, in some cases, number one, low-income kids in Florida are number one on the nation's report card. So accountability done right, I think, works. Accountability done in a way that's not transparent is really meaningless. So how do you get states, how are, as a nation, are we going to get states to get back on board with accountability given the direction that they're going? I'm not talking about states that are already yeah. committed to it. Well, I, it's, uh, it is a state question. I think eventually if you, you know, if, if, Florida's Hispanic kids in the fourth grade NAEP test do two grade levels ahead of Californians. Um, same kids, same background. Uh, you begin to wonder, well, maybe this system is focused on the right things rather than uh, just passing along uh, the buck. So I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I think No Child Left Behind was a little heavy handed, but I like the fact that it did, did force states to come up with their own accountability system. Now, one solution to this would be stop the over-testing. You know, we're, uh, you can do that if it becomes, people, people confuse, they don't confuse, they see testing as, as, uh, as accountability. And you, you know, it's hard to have accountability unless you measure, but most of the mandated tests come from local school districts, not from states. And so states ought to say, um, we, we, we need to have fewer, better tests that actually are diagnostic tools if moms particularly would receive information early, so you take the test, and this crazy internet thing actually helps here again, if they, they can get the, they can get the uh, diagnostic uh, results of the test, so it's part of the accountability system, but it's also a diagnostic tool to see how their son or daughter is doing, and they're given, um, they're given the information on what they could do in the summertime and the entering you know, the, the teacher for the next year gets this information and the outgoing teacher does as well and they develop strategies, then testing becomes a tool that parents love. Testing today is done way too early. It is totally opaque in terms of the results and there's not the kind of information that could create a strategy for, for enhanced learning. And so if we're serious about accountability, I think we have to deal with this testing issue in a much better way. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to note, by the way, on this app of asking questions, you can also vote for the questions that you like. So you feel free to look at the questions there and see which ones you like. We'll be getting to those in a few minutes. Um, related to this uh, uh, to the issue of accountability, and you alluded to it, is, um, t is teachers. That's a good question right there. So, oh, you, you, you like the question? <laughs> Do you like that top one there? <laughs> no, no, not that one. You, you, he's getting a preview. <laughs> Well, we'll start with that one then. Um, <laughs> you, you, have to, you, can, you can have your, your back brain thinking about that tough question while we, we ask my, my softballs. I'm going to um, close my eyes. I didn't see it. I get a surprise. <laughs> Go ahead. The, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about teacher, teachers and how teachers are viewed. You know, we had a time, um, I think, during this accountability-driven um, period that we were intensely in where teachers were looked at pretty critically. There was a lot of talk about teacher evaluations, about teacher bonuses, which of course means some teachers don't get bonuses. Um, a lot of accountability for teachers and, you know, Time Magazine, you know, famously put Michelle Ree from Washington, D.C., where I live, um, on the front cover with a broom in her hand, you know, sweeping out the old. And now we're in a period where teachers are being viewed much differently. There's a lot of highlight on how um, a successful teacher strikes successful, other su successful teacher actions. Um, Time Magazine recently had four covers of teachers who were you know, taking second jobs just to, to pay their bills. Um, we've had already a half dozen teacher strikes this year. Um, several of them successfully concluded, even teacher strikes at charter schools. I'm wondering what you make right now of where teachers are um, and what you, do you see this as a swinging, swinging pendulum? Is it a positive direction we're moving in? Do you have concerns? Well, first of all, I'll separate the teaching profession with the collective bargaining process of teachers unions seeking, um, you know, more money for teachers. They have, they have been more aggressive politically, the unions have, than in the past, Some, sometimes successful, sometimes not. The, the teaching profession um, 
the challenge is how do you create a system of evaluation and a, a pay package based on performance? And it's been hard. It is really hard to be able to do this. Um, and so there's been a retrenchment um, away from that. But I think ultimately, to simplify this in, in, you know, in, my, in my Tomorrowland, which I love the title since that's totally stolen from uh, Disney World in, in Miami, in Orlando, <laughs> excuse me. In my Tomorrowland, uh, you would pay teachers more for serving in underserved areas. You would pay teachers more for teaching in underserved courses. There's huge shortages in the STEM-related fields. And you would, you would pay teachers more um, for a, an evaluation system that includes peer review, student review, and how they do over an extended period of time with like-kind kids. That part is a little bit harder, but there should be some rewards for excellent teachers. Um, there should be a pathway for them to not have to leave the classroom in order to achieve economic success when they love staying in the classroom. I'm not, I'm not sure there's any place that has been able to figure this out um, in, the, you know, in, the, in the optimum way. But we can't just ignore it and say that every teacher is the same because the research suggests that a great teacher will provide a year and a half worth of learning to their students and a bad teacher could be a half a year. And so you lose the lottery for two years and the gaps grow pretty dramatically. And then you also find that the, uh, the caliber of teaching is uneven as it relates to certain schools. Um, in the inner city schools, at least my experience uh, is principally in Florida, in the uh, inner city schools you find the newly arrived teachers because the, the teachers that are going to stay in the profession move back closer to their homes perhaps or there's all sorts of real, you know, the school safety might be better or kids are more anxious to learn. Whatever the reason is, in our process of, of collective bargaining, they can move out and the underperforming or lower income schools are the ones that um, have the inexperienced teachers. My suggestion to that in Tomorrowland would be to give principals a lump sum, uh, not to have it a plugged item in the collective bargaining process, but to say, you get X hundreds of thousands of dollars for your teachers. You pick who you want, uh, but you can't pick all the high-performing teachers or all the teachers that have higher salaries. You have to pick, you have to create a cadre of teachers that uh, can help the struggling teachers improve. You have to put a budget in there for remediation for teachers that haven't mastered the material. Uh, but you create school equity funding, which we do not have. They play like it because the per student funding may be the same in each school. But if you take out the employment cost of, of, of schools, you're full. I mean, it's, it's, a, total, it's a total sham. Um, very few places move to that school-based budgeting approach, but that would, that would have a powerful impact on uh, rewarding great teachers in my mind. Okay. Um, another non-controversial topic. How one of your um, signature issues has also been school choice. Yeah. Promoting school Proud choice. Of it. The uh, most, I'd say the nation's foremost promoter of school cho choice is our Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, who you I used have to compete with. with her on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, at the moment, she's, uh, she's <laughs> you know, she's still collecting a, collecting a, or she's now collecting a, uh, a check from the taxpayers. Um, well, why? she donates to charity, just for the record. <laughs> what? But, um, true <laughs> enough. Um, what, um, what the I don't think I she have, needs it for the record either. Yeah, I, I, I don't think she does either. <laughs> when, the, uh, when all these cabinet secretaries were getting in trouble for, uh, you know, private planes on the government dime, you know, she don't never, worry about Betsy. she has a private plane, <laughs> but it's not, not on the government dime. Um, but why hasn't her agenda advanced? In fact, you could argue that, in fact, she, it has, school choice has become more toxic in Washington since she got behind it. She hasn't been able to, even with a, two years of a Republican-controlled Congress, she wasn't able to get anything into the tax bill, wasn't able to really get anything into the budget bills, hasn't, hasn't really been able to get anywhere on the school choice agenda. And given that she, this is her issue, or that she's championed her entire life, why do you think it is that she, or adult life, that she hasn't been able to make more progress? Well, first of all, she's operating in a culture that is driven by gridlock and dysfunction. I mean, let's face it, nothing gets done in Washington, or a handful of things get done. So um, you could say that about every cabinet secretary or anybody that is a proponent for policy change. Very, very little gets done. Secondly, this, I think our education system should be um, state-driven. So if the federal government can play a role 
it would be in the way that she laid out uh, the tax credit idea, which is don't, I mean, I don't want people messing with the Florida tax credit program, the largest of its kind. Um, I don't want intrusion into our system of accountability. Uh, and I think other states would, would, would say the same thing. So it's, uh, and then you got 60 votes required in the Senate to pass anything. So two years, you're right, the Republicans were in charge, but there were a lot of things they didn't do that, that they should have done in my mind. That would have been one of them. Um, this is, I think it's important to have the conversation about empowering particularly low-income students with the, the choice to, to be able to go to a school that otherwise they won't be able to go to. Um, I think working families um, ought to be part of that. And in Florida and other states, there's efforts away, underway right now to do just that. And make it a hearty debate about it, and, and you'll have an advocate in, the, in Betsy DeVos as Secretary of Education to be a supporter. I mean, to expect Washington to dictate this is, is uh, probably not the right way to go. Mm -hmm. And what do you think President Trump's legacy in education is going to be? Not a whole lot. Doesn't bother me though. I mean, it's not, it's not where his passions are. So um, I'd love to see the debate, as I said, move to uh, thinking about what it's like in you know, America 10 years from now. Let's put, put yourself in the shoes of a mom and dad of a kindergartner right now. What's that child's life gonna look like as they approach their, you know, the end of their high school experience? Are they gonna have the tools to be college and or career ready? And I would say right now, we're stuck in a system that's not gonna guarantee enough of our young people to be able to be successful in that regard. So it's not necessarily a policy. The president could be a, an advocate of getting people to think differently, but um, I mean, a girl can dream on that. I just don't think that's gonna happen. Um, he over the weekend. Uh, I don't know if you caught this at CPAC. I, I didn't. Let's talk about education. He, this is about education. This is about education, actually. He didn't said, see it. He's, well, I'll, I'll let you know what he said. Fidel he Castro's said, speeches are as long as that, and not, people in Cuba don't listen to me. <laughs> well, either. so you heard about it. it was two like, hours. Two I mean, hours. To loud. You cover a lot in two hours. You told me to speak for he, six minutes. Yeah. I know, well, I do. Uh, well, you're, you're maybe more of a rule follower than, uh, than <laughs> President really? Trump. Really? He's, <laughs> he's uh, just a little bit. Uh, he is, <laughs> he did, well, I guess if you talk for two hours, eventually you're gonna get to education. Um, he, he did, in fact, he suggested that the federal government withhold federal dollars from universities that do not protect free speech on campus, in particular an eye towards conservatives who feel they are not having the right to speak on campus. and. I, I was a little struck by that because I um, have talked to many people at the Department of Education about this question, and the answer always comes back, no, we don't believe in federal mandates for conservative um, points of view any more than federal mandates for liberal points of view. And so I was uh, um, not necessarily surprised because nothing really surprises you in, in Washington these days, but that struck me as a little, um, something I wasn't expecting. I'm just wondering if you think it's a good idea. I don't think it's, I don't know, first of all, whether how you do that. And a lot of times now in the political world in D.C., both sides, they advocate things. They have no, uh, I mean, in their wildest dreams do they ever envision it actually happening. <laughs> it's more of just making a point. And so without knowing whether um, being a rules-based guy, as you said, I'm not going to pine on something that is probably just something that's going to go into the ether. Um, having said that, I don't know if you've been to college campuses recently, um, but there, there, is, uh, there is a restriction of speech. Um, I'm, I'm proudly a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I may, let's see if I can say this right. I'm a uh, presidential professor of practice at Pennsylvania. Mm. And the reason why Amy Gutman, the president of the university, invited me to do this for a year, and I don't teach a class, I just go on campus, is I'm a conservative. And students don't have access to conservatives. <laughs> Their professors certainly aren't. I mean, in 2000, when my brother ran uh, for election, he got... He came in third in the university professor vote. Gore got, you know, 90%. Nader got 8%. Mm -hmm. My brother got one guy from, you know, <laughs> either UT or a and It's like, <laughs> that was it. I mean, so there, there is a narrowing of, of uh, tolerance for uh, different views. And so I think she smartly said, let's, let's have someone who's a, you know, committed, consistent conservative go to talk to, to students about Entrepreneurial capitalism, limited government, how the Bill of Rights matters, how we protect ourselves from an, an, an oppressive federal government. Those are 
traditional conservative values that you don't hear much about these days in DC. There's a temporary, uh, the fever has spread and kind of gotten people kind of off their, um, off their game a bit. But I think young people need to hear these things. They don't have to agree with them, but they ought to have, those views ought to be heard. And so, put aside what the president said and how he's going to punish them and all that, I think having that uh, dialogue would be important. Mm -hmm. So you did listen to the speech? No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I'm just all right, all right. I didn't. Uh, Promise. All right, we're going to move to we're going to move to audience questions. We have some great ones here. The, um, for better or worse, Governor, the top question by far remains: What advice about the education conversation would you give to any of the 2020 presidential candidates? Well, I gave my advice would be to to not make a five point plan to cure the common cold from Washington D.C., but to use the the presidency can be a place for convergence. It can be a place where you can begin to think differently about things. That's what leaders do. It's not just about a specific policy. It's about laying the foundation for a deeper conversation about the, the, the inequality that we're going to face based on student outcomes. And it is a, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to have lived through the 70s and young enough to have lived in the 60s, uh, and those were turbulent times. I look over the horizon and I see greater turbulence based on the fact that you have too many kids that are functionally illiterate or don't see education in a purposeful way because they haven't ever been challenged. They have the skills, they have the capabilities of doing it, but our system isn't, isn't giving them the tools to be successful. And those that are successful end up going to the fancy schools like Penn you know, uh, and then they'll all aggregate amongst themselves and they'll, they'll self-select uh, and they'll live w amongst one another and they'll live fantastic lives and they'll marry one another and their children will all be brilliant and all that. <laughs> and we're, our society is changing because we haven't transformed how our education system works. I would love to see, whether it's on the left or right, politicians talking about that being the great equalizer, the great civil rights issue of our time the greatest economic development issue of our time. Not to have a plan to say, I'm going to do this from Washington, D.C. I'm not going to, as president, be the superintendent of schools, but to, to show its importance so that at the local level, there's a deeper conversation of the changes necessary. Maybe that way you could build consensus. The vision thing, Yeah, I believe, is what they call, what might, have, might have called that upon, once upon yeah. a time. All right, next question is um, second most popular um, from Alexandra. What, role, what should the role of the Federal Department of Education be in driving innovation and change in education? You can speak to it either K-12 and or higher ed. You've talked about a limited role for the federal government. So can you just maybe pinpoint yeah. a couple thoughts on what it should be doing? This is actually a place where I think, um, not just in education, but the Defense Department, you look at DARPA, there are models of where the federal government has played a more than outsized role in advancing uh, innovation. DARPA's role was to provide technology, continues to, to pro provide technology to keep us safe, but there's all sorts of spin outs from DARPA that have played a huge role in, in our economic progress. And so I would say that if you had to pick one thing the Department of Education um, should be really good at, it's to create an R&D arm where you're allowing, you know, there's all sorts of ways that um, we, we train teachers, some of which are really horrible where teachers come into the classroom and they have no clue what they're doing, and then we say, oh, you know, this is horrible. Uh, maybe there's greater, you know, we need more research on making sure that teachers are equipped with the skills from day one to be able to teach uh, in a magnificent way, where that, that information is not, not debatable, that you have enough uh, research-based data to be able to empower teachers. There's other elements of this. How do you create uh, a test that is actually diagnostic. How, how can you create a test that measures what you want more of and what you're expecting grade by grade, but that it immediately comes back to the teacher, to the parent, and to the next year's teacher in a way that, that makes it really relevant to improve learning? Um, that's not an easy thing. There are, there are private sector enter, entities, not-for-profit entities, universities looking at this, but some of the funding could be coming from the federal government. So I see, I see more, less of you know, fretting about mandates about how to do things and more about being a catalyst for innovation in a world that desperately needs it. Okay. Um, you won't win a presidential election advocating that, by the way, but. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, our, based on our, our last presidential election was not real heavy on the, the details of policy. Zippo. I think it's fair to say. And I, I think uh, Hillary Clinton might, that might be the place where you and Hillary Clinton uh, agree. Uh, she, she had quite a few five-point plans of, of her own um, that didn't go, didn't go real far. I, my, one, my ideas had never made the light of day because I didn't shout at a profanity in, in the in advocacy of them was, um, if states want to take all their early childhood, uh, if they want to take all the federal, 22 different federal government programs in early childhood literacy and put it together and develop a, I'm not kidding, strategy to assure that four-year-olds entering kindergarten are capable of taking on kindergarten work, I think that power ought to be given to the states to do it um, in return for making sure that state funding is adequate. We have universal pre-K in, in uh, Florida. It could be funded in a more dramatic way, but there are more four-year-olds receiving state support in literacy-based programs in Florida than any state in the country. And by the way, we don't have an income tax. We're not a big government state. We don't tax everything that walks and breathes. But this is a high priority. And the federal government's approach to this is highly bureaucratic. It's not outcome-based. It's not part of a strategy. It just comes down. And, and it's great for some kids, but it's not in, in the form of a strategy. Those kind of things, um, it'd be great to have those conversations, but people don't want to give up the power they have. Yeah. Okay. Um, to move to a mastery model that you spoke of earlier requires not just policy changes, but major changes to the teaching workforce as well. How do you think that can be accomplished alongside the policy changes? Great question. And it's, it's, this is not going to be uh, the easiest thing in the world to do. You take the best practices that, have emer or that are emerging and you embrace them. Um, and, you know, how, how you, the, the, whole, the whole teaching uh, development um, budget if you take the cumulative effect of every 13,000 school districts and add up all the money going for teachers' development, uh, teaching development, it's a big chunk of money, but again, it's not spent strategically. If you were going to move to a mastery-based system, clearly how you develop uh, the cadre of next generation of teachers or train the existing teachers, which is the first step, you would have to make that the highest priority. I mean, there's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's being done. Um, and it's being done with good results. And I think we should move as fast as we can um, along the way, changing policies state by state to make sure that it happens in, a, in an effective way, doesn't create chaos. Right. Sarah asks, you spoke beautifully about the skills gap that currently prevents our students from being career ready. What skills beyond the three R's do our students most need? And, and I'll just add as an addendum to that question, what do you make of the um, focus on social and emotional learning that has become so popular? Well, first of all, I'm no fool. It's a high priority in this conference, so I love it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, look, there are people, people, people come to school with totally different circumstances today. Uh, and to, to ignore that, I think we do at our peril. So understanding where kids start, where, where, where they are emotionally and where they are socially is really important. And I think if you envision how, how the workforce looks like 10 years, what it looks like now in Austin and San Francisco and other places, there's a lot more collaborative learning. There's a lot more um, team learning. Uh, it's trying to mirror how life looks inside the classroom would be helpful. Um, and and we're, not, uh, we're not doing that at a pace, I think, that uh, is appropriate. So, uh, it's a great question, both how you prepare teachers, but also how you create the systems around learning that's not just based on accountability um, or mastering the material. It's, it's what are the other skills that are necessary, the so-called soft skills, to be successful in life. I would, I would add, um, and this may be a little provocative, I, we're, we, are, uh, we have broken ourselves up into our tribal parts. Um, and the idea that you know, we have to defend public education for, uh, because there's a set of common values that emerge from the public education experience. I totally support, but public education is not doing that right now. And getting back to creating a shared vision of what it is to be an American, whatever form of learning takes place, I think is a responsibility for uh, the next generation of, of policymakers. Because it's dangerous when you break up in your disparate parts. You only get your information from one source, one type of information. It makes you more righteous about your views. It makes you more susceptible to so-called fake news. It makes you less tolerant of other people's views. 
Um, and in a country as diverse as, as, as ours, not having that shared identity, which starts with a quality education, I think is perilous. All right, I'm going to ask one more question from here. If so, anybody has a question that they that's, is that's burning to them. That's civics education. That, that's what you'd like me to ask? Well, no, I just answered it without knowing yes, it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> I agree. Um, right, so if you're going to have a mastery-based system in a, you know, it's a, it's a round peg in a square world, you, don't, you shouldn't necessarily have to, you'd have to have some um, movement away from end of year testing. If you've mastered it, why, right now, these school districts that do this, they have to take this, the, the same end of school uh, tests that every other school in their, in their district and state tech take. If you're moving to the system over time, you would want to have funding and how we assess done, you know, in an efficient way that, uh, that rewards the system that you're implementing rather than creates an, an additional burden. So mastery of the material um, is done all the time in private sector settings for adults. It's done all the time in lots of uh, endeavors in our own lives, and I think you can do it in school, but the end of school test would be, over time, I think, become obsolete. All right, if anyone has a question they definitely want asked and they and they fear it won't, we won't get to it or have one not from the table, please go to the microphone. Um, I will call on you, I promise, at least the first person up at the microphone. So if you really want your question, go stand up. Um, thoughts on Betsy DeVos's new Title IX rules? I don't know, know enough about it. All right. I'll to be honest off. with you. Um, what is, is Title IX is the... Um, it involves um, sexual assault and yeah. harassment on campus. I, I don't know. Okay. I haven't followed it. Um, we as educators only truly have at most eight hours a day with our students. How do you get parents involved in their child's learning? You give them transparent information. We've, we've done a lot of work in this regard, and uh, parents want information about the status of where their, where their kids are. That's the highest priority. If you go online to every, all the 50 state education departments and try to get the information about how a school's doing, it's, it is the least consumer-friendly experience that you'll ever go through. It's like, get, like going to a perpetual root canal. Um, <laughs> we, we have artificial, in, you, if, you, if you have a, um, a, a solid test that's assessing how kids are reading, for example, with artificial intelligence, and there are companies and not-for-profit organizations doing this, uh, contracting with schools, uh, departments of education now, but only on the margins so far, you can create a diagnostic uh, description of where your child is lagging, how you as a parent can help that child overcome that. If it's near the end of the year, you can, you can create a plan of action for what goes on in the summer. And if you, to me this is really important, that um, if you're serious about making sure that every child has a chance to learn, you have to empower the first teachers of our children to be able to have the tools to be successful. They can't be isolated and marginalized. And the, look, the argument that I hear all the time, and I've heard it, you know, I've been doing this a long while, that you can't impose uh, uh, all of life's burdens on the classroom because life's burdens, you know, are, are really difficult. Um, I, I reject out of hand. Because if, that, if you start with that argument, then the, you conclude, well, there's nothing we can do. And I reject that out of hand. Because we don't have the luxury of doing that anymore. We have to make sure everybody has the chance to live a life of purpose and meaning. We can't just excuse away why some kids aren't given that access. And part of the answer is to assume that children love their parents, love, their parents love their children with their heart and soul, irrespective of the level of their income. And assume that that's the case. Sometimes it might not be. In the great majority of the case, it is. And then empower them. Uh, that's why I'm a supporter of school choice, but also empower them with the knowledge of what's going on in the classroom so students um, can succeed. No one's at the microphone. No one gets to complain when they didn't get their question. Whoa. Oh, here's someone. All right. That's Go a ahead. cool outfit. I'm going for it. Thanks. When in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Go, go ahead. Okay, my question. Um, how can we partner, we as educators, partner with big business to innovate and to achieve mastery, student-centered learning in public schools 
so that we can flip the conversation from us versus them or public yeah. versus privatization to let's collaborate and take the best of both worlds. Well, this is the optimum time to be talking about that because whether they're big businesses or not, business, the highest priority, the number one issue that businessmen and women face in this country almost uni universally across the board is they can't find talent. And so many of the uh, larger corporations that have scale and have the resources are basically doing this internally because they don't see uh, other you know, institutions responding. AT&T, I think, has, in any given day, a couple hundred thousand uh, employees that are, that are gaining um, cert certifications, they're gaining um, uh, credentials that allow them to be able to go from a wire uh, line job, which are going to be obsolete in the next five years, to some other element of this vast business. Uh, they're, given the, they're given a pathway to achieve success. So envision that environment where people are desperately looking for folks to work, particularly in high school, and I think you could find that there'd be all sorts of interest if you open up the system and allow them to be true partners. Not just write a check, but be true partners in how you design these programs. Yes, ma'am. No, you, you were, you were gonna say something. I thought there was somebody behind me. No, no, <laughs> you, had a, you had another follow-up, I could tell. I, uh, I did. Um, then then um, how do we, change the, our thinking then, because when you think of opportunity scholarships in Florida, I'm a 35-plus uh, year uh, Floridian educator, um, how do we change that, that perception of opportunity scholarships to be only chartered big business for-profit charter schools to the kinds of things that, that you're talking about? Well, first of all, opportunity scholarships uh, went to private schools. That's probably even worse than for you, but <laughs> it didn't go to uh, didn't no, go to charter right. schools. Exactly. Um, I, I think an open system is a better system, and I think there are, there is great stuff going on in the traditional public schools of Florida. Ninety percent of of students go to traditional public schools. We have gone from 50th out of 50 in the country to the national average, more or less, on our graduation rate. Our low-income kids are lights out improvements uh, compared to other states and compared to their, um, the equivalent students a generation ago. Those are huge improvements, and because we have more options, everybody has gotten better. And so I don't, I don't see this as a problem. If, if AT&T has a big operation in Jacksonville, which they do, and they have a skills gap, and the technical, where, where are you from, by the way? Where am I from? Yeah, what's the, what? Uh, Broward County. I'm not sure ATT is big there, but you have big corporations. There to to turn these uh, programs from technical ed into career-oriented activity um, and expand dramatically the the nationally recognized certificate program that you all have. Florida went from three percent of student of, of high school kids being able to access a program like that to 37 percent in a decade of time. So there's a lot of things going on that that's good, but you have to invite them in. You know, invite them in, welcome them. They're not, they're not the problem. They're, they could be part of your solution. All right, I think we may just have time for one, maybe two more. We, I don't want to disappoint the 15 people who want this question. How does the physical school building need to evolve to support education in the future? Obviously, it needs to evolve um, inside the classroom for the more collaborative learning kinds of environments. Uh, I have etched in my mind this knowledge school um, model, which if you go into it, it's like people are learning in the cafeteria, they're learning in, in quiet areas, they're learning in the classroom, they're learning in a dramatically different way. Uh, and the physical design of the school could enhance that or it could make it nearly impossible. I am assuming this relates to security. I think it might. And it should. And there's another place where old design um, Parkland being a, a sad, tragic example of it, of, of multiple buildings that were not secure uh, in the new world we're in, you would want to have design that doesn't look like a fortress but does have uh, security elements in it that um, protects, protects students. That's just commonsensical. Every um, effort to look at this in Florida and other places that I've read about is advocating a you know, modern uh, design for new school buildings that takes that into account. Yes, sir. 
Uh, Governor, my name is Hunter Taylor. I teach at the University of Mississippi and help train a cohort of teachers each year uh, in a program called the Mississippi Teacher Corps. And our teachers go exclusively to the critical needs schools in the state. So particularly in the Mississippi Delta and yep. Jackson, East Central, et cetera. And I really like what you said uh, about moving to a mastery model. But I was curious how you would rally support for this type of opposition. So I know you're well traveled and you've seen not only you know, the inner city, but also the rural town where uh, these events and these traditions are embedded in the community, like senior homecoming or big brother was on the state championship football team or yeah, yeah, all, all important. This. And so, and we're talking about, you know, if you move to that type of model that you mentioned where, you know, once I master this, then I go to ninth, you know, once I master this, I accelerate. So what do you, how would you rally support that, hey, you're still going to get these things that are so embedded into the community? I that Great question. A sense of pride. Phenomenal question, because that's really important. Not just um, that's important across the board. It's um, so. What I would say is that children, students would would stay with their age group. You're not. A, you know, if you skip a grade because you're a seventh grader doing ninth grade work, you wouldn't be in ninth grade. Um, let me give you an example. Florida Atlantic University has a um, a um, magnet school uh, in which their children, their students, most of them graduate with three years of college under their belt. But their high school kids that either go across the street to the university for some of their courses, but they're taking college level coursework in their school. Now, they don't have the remediation uh, issue because these are, they, they, they get students from three different counties. But the same principle would apply, that you would socialize with students in your age group, but you might be taking dramatically different coursework in the same classroom. And I think that's, that's the answer. The problem, uh, a problem in rural life is that the economic interests of the adults in the system are the biggest drawback right now for thinking differently about how, how we educate because there's a threat of the largest employer in many of these rural areas losing you know, their, their status. So there has to be some political strategies around how do you lessen people's anxiety and fears about this, how this could become a tool for their students to be able to be successful as well. And that has not worked out real well. If you look at the policy results in the last few years, here in Texas is a good example of it, where innovation has been stymied because people, particularly in the rural areas, represented by rural state representatives, are fearful of change. Good luck with what you're doing. It sounds really important. Thank you. Well, that is the end of our hour. Um, thank you so much um, for you, answering my questions and all the audience's questions. The, I think it's fair to say that in a time when not every uh, politician that we encounter is steeped in policy and able to really in, engage in a conversation like this, that it's clear that um, your passions uh, for this issue just come through so clearly as well as your thank knowledge. You. And I'm so glad you thank were you able are. to I have share a, this. Um, I have to, uh, I would normally <laughs> say hello to everybody and continue the conversation, but I lost my TSA pre-clear <laughs> deal, and um, I'm terrorized about the uh, my ability to get on the, the five o'clock flight to uh, yes, Miami. It's going to help so you relate to I'm the out of here. regular people. <laughs> Thank you.